My name is Alan Henriksen. I'm teaching currently at the College of Europe in Bruges, uh, a course on diplomacy today, theory and practice. Uh, I'm here as the Fulbright Professor of U.S.-EU Relations. And back home in the U.S., I'm Director of Diplomatic Studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where I've been teaching uh, diplomatic history and some other subjects for many years. At the College of Europe, I am focusing on the development of the new European External Action Service. Many of the students in the Department of EU International Relations and Diplomacy Studies are hoping to become European diplomats. They come from all over Europe, a few from elsewhere, including the U.S., uh, and they're hoping to represent not just their individual countries, but Europe as a whole. Some of them, of course, will join the for ministries of foreign affairs of their individual nation nations. The U.S.-European relationship now is improving very markedly as a result in part of the recent Lisbon summit meeting during which President Obama met not only with the leadership of NATO but also the top new leadership of the European Union where it was possible to discuss not only difficult problems, uh, including the economy, the financial system, Afghanistan, uh, but also new fields, such as cooperation in energy, devising new standards for, among other things, uh, pr the production of electric electricity-driven cars, uh, which is a great interest of President Obama uh, as a way of shifting the reliance from petroleum to new sources of, of power. So in many respects, the cooperation level has been enhanced very significantly, and it's a market improvement from the days when the Iraq war was producing a major division between our, our two continents. Clearly, there is a difference of identity between the U.S. and Europe even though in some respects America is a child of Europe. Our fundamental values are the same, democracy, liberalism, a belief in the market economy, but nonetheless there are small differences which sometimes tend to be exaggerated. It's been called the, the narcissism of small differences, having to do with gun control policy, uh, having to do with uh, differences in medical care systems, uh, and the like. Nonetheless, there is a fundamental feeling in the U.S. that it is special. It's, uh, it's exceptional. But there's a counterpart feeling in Europe, that this new European experiment is something completely new. It's sui generis. It's never been tried anywhere before. Uh, it's difficult to understand. It hasn't yet arrived at perfection. But it's something new under the sun. Nonetheless, we have a very close relationship, and I've called it new familiarization. That is, not on the basis of kinship, necessarily, because Europeans and Americans come from many different places now in the world, but on the basis of actually knowing what our interests are, what our problems are, working together in business and in universities and many other fields. We're become, becoming familiar. We're knowing each other and how we work. So without any romanticism, we can develop a very closely knit uh, fabric of cooperation uh, in many areas, finance, education, energy, defense, uh, all kinds of areas. Uh, this is, I think, happening now, and I hope it will continue to happen. Nowadays, with the advanced economies we have, with the free market operating in America and in Europe, the government is becoming more and more important, not as the owner, the producer, but rather as the regulator of these enterprises. And what has happened in some areas is that different systems have developed in Europe and have been taken. There have been different path dependencies. And as a result of that, uh, institutions, companies have been created, business interests have developed such that they do not follow exactly the same procedures. Their standards are somewhat different. Uh, they, they compete, and it's impossible to make them cooperate at a late stage. So 
What Carl de Hooked was attempting to do as trade commissioner was at the beginning, at the start of a new industry, uh, like a shift to automo electrically powered automobiles, to develop some common standards so there could be much more interchangeability. Uh, so it will be possible, possible for Europe to export to the U.S. and vice versa, the finished product as well as the parts. Uh, this will greatly increase the efficiency uh, and, by the way, make both Europe and America much more competitive internationally. The financial crisis has had a profound effect in both American and European societies. It was, to put it simply, a wake-up call in both America and Europe as to how tightly interdependent our financial systems are. Uh, when Lehman Brothers failed in New York City, uh, this had an immediate effect uh, on the markets in, in Europe. So almost operating around the clock nowadays, the, the regulators in governments in Europe and the U.S. are, are monitoring the system to try to devise fail-safe systems so that banks will have greater reserves, so there will be more transparency, so within banks themselves there will be more control uh, over what different parts of the companies are doing. And this can only be done cooperatively. If one side or the other does it alone, resources will shift uh, and the balance will be upset once again. And if America and Europe can cooperate in this field, and within the context of the G20, there's a very good chance that this may positive, positively affect uh, financial standards around the world as a whole. The fact that Europe, like the United States, <clears throat> is diverse and is becoming more diverse, so far I think has not had a relation, an effect on the relationship at all. However, it may be wrong to say that America has had, has had more experience as an immigration society. I will say it is the American tradition to be an immigration society. But historically, of course, Europe is a much greater mixture than the United States uh, has ever been or, or, or could become. But in Europe, there's this notion of multiculturalism. That is, that, that, that the cultures have their own independent identities and need to interact, whereas in the U.S. there's a general acceptance that when someone comes from China or from Mexico or from, from Peru or from Nigeria, in very short order, they're celebrating Thanksgiving with, in exactly the same way that's, that, that some of the descendants of the Founding Fathers are. So there's, there's a sense of being an American, being a part of the American people, which has very little to do with where people came from. Europe, I think, is not there yet. And I know that there are some efforts to compare notes, that there are some local American communities that are working with sister cities, for example. Uh, meetings of mayors take place as, as to how they incorporate uh, immigrant groups in their communities in terms of getting, giving them jobs, language training, and so on. So at the local level, the level of cities, of, of provinces and, and states, there's a great deal that can be done uh, to share social experience, not necessarily at the level of, of summits of prime ministers and presidents, but at, at the level of people who are actually in charge of, of making local communities thrive and uh, become harmonious places. This, I think, is happening and probably much more that needs to happen. I would agree that Europe, in part because of its preoccupation with building its new institutions. For example, uh, the European External Action Service, which is a combination of the Commission, uh, this, the Secretariat of, of, of the Council, uh, with Parliament becoming involved in foreign affairs more, is very preoccupied with, with making, with re rebalancing uh, its, its own institutions. And this requires a lot of attention, uh, a lot of political focus on the part of, of the, le the leadership. So I think this is, this is the case at the political level. Also, the, f the financial crisis and the concern about, uh, about employment uh, 
uh, I think has made Europeans, like Americans, conscious of how jobs are going to be maintained, how the economy can be, be made to grow again. So this is, I think, a common factor that is making both Europe and America concentrate on matters at home, that the primary responsibility of the political leadership is to serve the interests of those who are their constituents. Uh, and therefore, this is a, a, a profound factor. Uh, of course, then, the, the preoccupation of the United States and Europe to a degree as well with the, with the Afghanistan war is a profound one. And uh, there is a feeling, I think well justified, that that involvement is not sustainable in the long run. So the desire to pull back from that and to try to avoid involvements of that kind or the involvement uh, in Iraq uh, would, would seem to, to be uh, a return to maybe a kind of isolationism. Uh, that's not the case. I see it more as a, as a corrective uh, so that American international influence can be redeployed in more positive ways in, in other places.